Greetings and welcome to this lecture on the engineering of viruses. Today we will be exploring the internal ribosome entry site of the SARS-CoV-2 virus as a potential target for the development of vaccines and other gene constructs for cellular expression. Let us delve into the topic itself. Now, if we look back at the evolution of the viral genome itself, there has been an article published in 2003 which did a comparative analysis of the SARS coronavirus genome. And if you look at this article and read through it, you will realize that the current pandemic was predicted a long time ago as the virus was found to be very infective and the authors of this article have indicated this in their references to other literature pertaining to the pathogenesis. Now if we look at the original genome from which was cited in this particular article is the SARS coronavirus TOR2 complete genome. So you can see that the size is the same approximately about 30,000 bases of RNA and this viral genome technically encodes what is known as a polyprotein. Uh, which you can see here in the green bar and it also has what are known as the untranslated regions which are the 5 prime terminal N as well as the 3 prime terminal N of the genome. Now these 5 prime and 3 prime terminal Ns are very important because they facilitate the translation of the viral mRNA into proteins. Let us look at the genome from the current reference genome. This is the SARS coronavirus to isolate Wuhan HU1 complete genome. Now this is used as a reference genome and all the other genomes are compared to this genome in similarity searches. Now again if you note the size it's around 29.90 bases. Now what I have done is I have looked at both these genomes and compared them not in terms of the protein sequences but purely in terms of the untranslated regions. Okay, now this is what I've done. So I have taken the 5 prime terminal end and have compared these two viruses using a similarity search. Now if you note this particular comparison or this alignment, you will notice that there are 236 out of 262 identities which implies that there is a similarity between these two genomic regions. There are also five gaps in this region which you can see. Okay, look here, there's a gap here. Now the point which I'm trying to raise is that this region has been conserved since 2003, the genome and till today which is around maybe around 16 years, 16 to 17 years. This region is highly conserved and the reason for this conservation may be related to its efficiency and its fixation because it is selected for its specialized function which is the role in translation and ribosome binding. Now this is a similarity of the 5 prime untranslated UTR in the currently available genomes at the NCBI gene bank. If you compare almost all of the SARS-CoV-2 viruses have a similar 5 prime untranslated region. So this points again to the importance of this region in the translation of the viral polyprotein. Okay, now if you look at the data on the 5' UTRs, you will see again high similarity. Okay, now if we want to construct a viral vector, what we essentially have is a 5' translated UTR or untranslated region, the protein coding region over here and the 3 prime untranslated region and these constitute the basis of a synthetic viral vector. Now the 5 prime untranslated region can be essentially the internal ribosome entry site sequence. This protein coding gene can be the viral proteins which you want to express as antigens in a cell line or they can also be other proteins. And then you have the 3 prime 
untranslated region. Now, in most uh, viral vectors, you will note that the three prime untranslated region is derived from the SV40 polyadenylation signal. However, in the case of the SARS virus, the three prime untranslated region is conserved as well and can serve as uh, an effective component of this synthetic construct. So, in this lecture, I am proposing that we have the 5 prime untranslated region, which is derived from the internal ribosome entry site of the virus itself. The protein coding region can be any of the load, or what we call the uh, loaded genes. These can be in the form of uh, antigenic principle. It can be in the form of any gene which one wants to express in the cell line, either in a cell line in vivo or in an animal model. And then you have the three prime untranslated region. So, if we want to take this one step further and express it in a cell line, we will have to uh, attach a promoter region upstream of the five prime translated UTR. Now, generally, the cytomegalovirus promoter is utilized in most viral vectors. However, if you look at the RNA expression itself, for instance, you want to carry out an in vitro RNA transcription and then you want to utilize the, the transcribed RNA for a transfection into cell lines. You need not necessarily include this CMV site. You can replace it with the T7 transcription start site. Now, how do you modulate translation in an internal ribosome entry site? And this is where it becomes more interesting. Because of the size of the 5 prime untranslated region, one can incorporate mutations into this region and then modulate the expression. So, the expression of this uh, protein, which may be in the form of a fluorescent signal reporter or in the form of your antigen, can be detected in quantitatively in this case. So, we use this modulation to regulate the translation of the protein itself. Now, what I have done is I explored the 5 the internal ribosome entry site, which is our potential candidate for the 5 prime region, uh, the region of interest for modulation. And I have folded it using M fold, an algorithm online. And when we uh, do the canonical folding, which is basically referring to the Watson Crick base pairing within this iris, we locate these regions A, B, C, D, E, and F. Now, this is a folding which has done at 37 degrees cent centigrade, which is the body temperature. And it is assumed that this canonical folding will be also manifested in vivo. Now, what can be done to determine, for instance, what is the region that binds to the ribosomal RNA is modification of this site. So, we create a new construct by truncating, for instance, A, and we check the signal in the construct in terms of the fluorescence intensity. We can uh, similarly truncate B, C, D, and E and F individually or in combinations, for instance, A and E, A and D, and so on and so forth, and check the effect of these modifications on the translational efficiency of the internal ribosome entry site. So, this is where we move on to the cell line assays and the hypothetical experiment. So, if we want to translate our work into a data set, we must do multiple steps. So, we first synthesize the gene constructs or an array of gene constructs, a combination of different variations of the iris. Then we transfect these into animal cell lines. This can be achieved in cell culture using uh, reagents such as lipofectamine. After the cell lines are transfected, we record the optical signals after induction. So, in the case of CMV promoter, there is no need to induce the, the gene for expression. So, we just have the uh, CMV and after about 48 hours, the signal can be recorded. And this can be recorded in terms of the quantitative as well as the qualitative level of expressions. And then you can uh, do additional validation assays using an antibody assay for your protein load, the, the gene which you have loaded onto that vector. And you can also do other assays such as the protein spectroscopy using MALDI or other methods to detect whether your protein has an appropriate signal. 
So this brings us to the conclusion which in which I want to show you the gene construct itself. So this is a potential gene construct and I have deliberately used different colors and font sizes so that it is visible in this video. So in this gene construct I have indicated this region. This is technically the cytomegalovirus promoter which is utilized in most um, uh, synthetic gene constructs for expression in cell lines. Then this is the region of interest. So this is the unmodified or the native UTR from the SARS-CoV-2 virus. This is the fluorescent reporter. So in this fluorescent reporter, you can note that there is an ATG site, a start and stop codon. And finally, this is the three prime untranslated region from the same virus. And it's very important to note that there is a poly ATL signal here. So this poly ATL will be, if it's for instance, if you, you do an in vitro transcription prior to transfection, you can you will see that you will obtain the full length of the messenger RNA which you can then uh, transfect directly into cell lines and you proceed to the assay of, for this optical signal. Now one thing which needs to be noted is that RNA can degrade very easily and if one translates oh, this degraded RNA in vivo, there is a high likelihood that there may be a termination of translation due to the degradation of the RNA molecule and this is one issue which must be addressed even when we are developing RNA vaccines. So we proceed to the next step which is the uh, uh, transfection of the cell line with the DNA plasmid itself with the cytomegalovirus promoter. So in this case the transcription and translation occurs in the cell line minimizing the risk of the degradation of the RNA molecule. So bringing the case for the IRS, because IRSs are used in most vectors. However, I have not seen any reports online of the IRS in the, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus being utilized in any of the vectors. So this IRS it has a potential for modifications and it has a potential for application in the cloning vectors due to its high processivity. Given the evidence of the infection in of the coronavirus in cell lines, it is highly likely that this IRS will be has potential industrial applications for the production of recombinant proteins in cell lines. That brings us to the end of this short presentation. Thank you very much for watching and I will keep you updated with regard to my research progress. Thank you.